Praise the Lord. Y'all ain't good to be in God's house tonight, this evening. We're so excited. Fran's going to start teaching again. Second Sunday. That's awesome. Amen. Give God some praise. That's a blessing, y'all. I'm going to ask if you would please stand on your feet. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you, Lord, that you're in our midst, that we can come to you and praise you, worship you, and glorify you, Father. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, that you paid the price. You laid your life down, that you're the advocate. And Lord, it's through you that we can have access to the Father. We can enter into his presence, even into the Holy of Holies, into the secret place, Father. And Lord, we just thank you. You're so good. You're so wonderful. You're so awesome. Lord, we ask that you would be in our midst here tonight. Have your way, Father. Oh, Lord, touch every heart, every soul, every vessel. That your anointing rest upon Alan and Fran, Father, as they come together with this word and what God's put in Fran's heart, Father. Lord, I thank you for this couple. I thank you for every soul, every vessel here in this house. And Lord, we just give you the praise. We give you the glory. We give you all the honor. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody says, Amen. Y'all give big, uh, God a big old clap of praise. It's Fran and Alan come tonight. Praise him. Hi guys. Hello. Um, Alan and I start our mornings with devotions and sometimes it's just a wonderful way to start the day and sometimes we get into some um, conversations that can be <laughs> interesting. So just uh, as I was preparing to start teaching again, uh, this we had this uh, devotional and it really led in to what the Lord was bringing me to teach more on the Holy Spirit. So I think it was a Holy Spirit thing all along. So we wanted just to, to abbreviate what happened that morning. We're inviting you to join us at our kitchen table. And uh, this, as I said, is just a little abbreviated form of the conversation that kind of unfolded that morning as we did our devotionals, okay? And I need to set the scene for you a little bit, too. Um, I'm, I'm dressed, you know, about like I am now in my very professional business clothes. And Fran is in her unbelievably cute, way too big jammies. Because <laughs> I've been fixing breakfast, that's why. <laughs> Watch out, it's hot. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, our devotional this morning is coming from Daniel chapter 5. So I'm going to read to you a little bit, and I'm going to, some of them are just going to shorten out and kind of tell you the story as, as I see it. Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple, which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem, and the king, his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. In that same hour, the figures of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. So, here's the story. We have King Belshazzar, son of Nebuchadnezzar, 
throwing party for a thousand of his best friends. The party got a little wild. The king got drunk and using the vessels of gold and silver taken from the temple of the house of God began to praise idols. And when he did, a hand appeared and wrote on the wall. And when the king saw the hand, he got knee-knocking afraid. And he couldn't interpret the writing. And neither could his wisest astrologers and astronomers. At that point, as he's desperate to learn what that writing meant, his mother comes to him and says, there's a man in your kingdom used to be a high advisor to your father who I think can interpret what that writing is on the wall. So Belshazzar said, bring him to me, and if he can interpret this writing, I'll give him a chain of gold around his neck and a third, and he'll be the third highest person in my kingdom. So, Daniel was summoned, and he was, it was explained to him that if he could interpret this writing, that he would receive this honor and, and this wealth. But he turned the honor and the wealth down and said, I'll, I'll tell you what this means, but let me give you a little background. Your father had got everything that he had, all of his power, all of his glory, and all of his wealth from the most high God. And he ruled over everything before him because he was given that by the most high God. And then his pride got the best of him and he lost his throne. His glory was taken away. His men drove him away and he lived like a beast in the field until he knew that God rules over all mankind. And He decides who, rule, who rules over. And he looked at Belshazzar and he said, you know what? You knew all this and you didn't humble yourself before God. You went as far as to partying, using the God's holy vessels to praise idols of silver, gold, wooden stone, yet you're not honoring the very God who gave you breath. So then he says, now I'm going to tell you what this says. And it's in three parts. God has numbered the days of your kingdom and it's over. You have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. And this very night, your kingdom will be divided between the Medes and the Persians. That very night, Belshazzar was slain. Darius the Mede got his kingdom. And it said, Darius recognized the God Daniel worshipped. Awful stuff. Yeah, it is. And, you know, it's Monday morning. And my mind's just going, I'm just seeing all the people on the roadways rushing back to work. And so many, Alan, have spent the weekend in their whole lives with no knowledge of God. They seem to don't even know Him or want to know Him. And I wonder, why doesn't God, if He will write in hand, with a hand to that pagan king, just shake the sky and say, hey, listen down there. Don't you know that I'm really real? Someday you're going to stand before me. You're going to give an account to me for the life you've lived. Why doesn't God just shake the sky and speak in an audible voice? My heart is so heavy for these people that don't know Him. Know something? Let's look at something else. What? Wow. 
This is from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 10. Especially concerning the day you stood before the Lord your God in Horeb. When the Lord said to me, Gather the people to me, and I will let them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth, and that they may teach their children. Then you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire in the midst of heaven, with darkness, cloud, and thick darkness. And the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of His words, but saw no form, only heard His voice. You know, and not only did the Lord speak from the Mount, from Mount Sinai, but think about it. These very people had the cloud by day and the fire by night to know that He's there. That the Lord has spoken through the times that we see in the Bible, through dreams and visions directly to certain people. He has brought angels down to give messages to His people. He even inspired holy men to actually write down His words so that we would have them. He sent prophets to warn them when they got off the path. And then, Jesus came in the flesh so that we could talk to Him, so that they could see Him face to face. Wow, and if that wasn't enough, He came in the person of the Holy Spirit to live in us so that He could be with us every moment of every day until we look in His eyes and see Him face to face in heaven. What more could God do? What more could He do? So that really happened a Monday morning several weeks ago. This Bible teacher sits there and says, why doesn't God just speak in an audible voice, shake the sky? And he has. He has. He's done that. And many other things. So that is uh, the introduction to the study that I want to continue that I had begun already on the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And the reason I want to share this, dear family, is because many years ago, as the Lord began to draw me to a deeper walk, He brought the Holy Spirit to, to study the Holy Spirit, to know more about the Holy Spirit. It, it's just, it made such a difference in my life, and I want to share this, you know, with you, because uh, it's just, it's one of, it's a, this is the priceless gift of the presence of God that comes to live within us. It's a priceless gift. And it seems like the more we're aware of that, the more he, we interact with him and the more intimacy that we can have if we are aware of this precious gift of the Holy Spirit. And we don't have to stand in fear at the foot of the mountain. It's a beautiful, intimate relationship. How far, you know, how blessed we are to be able to experience the Spirit of God in this intimate way. So that's what we want to... Um, I, I want to open up in prayer first, and then we will go into thinking more about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. So let's just invite him in. I don't even want to be here without his anointing, without his presence. I have nothing to share with you aside from, from the empowerment of the Holy Amen. Spirit. Amen. So Holy Spirit, we do welcome you in this place. 
we say you are so very welcome. You are more than welcome. You are desired. You are my desire. So Holy Spirit, come in a greater way into our hearts, into our lives. Reveal more and more of the, the person and the beauty of this Jesus that we love. This one that we long to know deeper. And you are the one that draws us into that, that relationship with our Lord. So tonight as we look at these scriptures, as we focus on who you are, may each one go away empowered, uh, just, just with a deeper desire to draw close to you and to draw on your power to show us the Lord and to help us to live a life that honors him. So come Holy Spirit and speak tonight to each and every heart and we just love you and Father it's all about you. It's all about Jesus. It's all about your finished work in your precious name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> So as we want to know more about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, who better to tell us than Jesus, right? You, got, you guys agree with that? Who better than Jesus? Mm -hmm. So I want us to think about the night, the, what, who Jesus said the Holy Spirit is. And we're going to go to John 14, and it's important to understand uh, the this, this setting here, the timing here, because this is the night before Jesus was crucified. This is the night that he had just washed the disciples' feet, including Judas, and he knew that this would be the last time that he would be able to spend with them. He knew the next morning that he would be crucified, and he wanted, he knew he was going back to be with the Father and wouldn't be with these men anymore and he wanted to prepare them as much as he possibly could for his leaving so that's why he begins John 14 with these precious words let not your heart be troubled and he was say, of course saying don't be afraid and then he goes on in verse 16 of that, that chapter to tell them why they didn't need to be afraid and here's what our Lord said in preparation for his disciples in the coming of the Holy Spirit. I will pray the Father, or I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And you can just sense the tenderness, can't you? The heartfelt words from our, our Savior as he tried to prepare his disciples for his leaving. He refers to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of truth. And one of the main reasons is that the Holy Spirit reveals the truth about Jesus, doesn't he? And many other things. And then Jesus goes on to say, I will not leave you orphans. I will, I will come to you. So what does that say to us? The Holy Spirit is the very presence of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the very presence of Jesus. And don't you love those words? I will not leave you orphans. You're not alone. I will be with you. And then he goes on to say in verse 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So here Jesus is calling the Holy Spirit the teacher, the helper. And he explained that the Holy Spirit would remind him of words that he had said, but they didn't, you know, it was like one of those things that goes by and you don't catch it. But after the Holy Spirit came to, to live within them, they would remember Jesus' words and they, they would remember them then. So that's what Jesus is telling them here. And we know that this happened because we have the account in the Word of God about how how these these disciples before the Holy Spirit come in there in Acts two, they were fearful men, weren't they? They were they were they were afraid, and they Peter denied the Lord, and uh, but after they were filled with the Holy Spirit, man, they were fearless. The more they were persecuted, the bolder they got. It really just changed them for the Holy Spirit to come and, and empower them and, and give them understanding about things Jesus had said, but they, they didn't get it. You know, they just didn't get it. 
And then Jesus goes on to say to them in uh, chapter 16 and verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And I'm sure this was a huge challenge for these men to understand how anything could be better than the Lord's presence. But this is what Jesus was telling them. It's to your advantage. I'm going to, it's going to be better for you. And we know the reason being, Jesus was limited in his physical body. And uh, he could only be with a few at a time, you know, and only for a season. But he, isn't it wonderful that our God has this way that he can be with each of us? Did you know he's your, you're his favorite? And at the same time, I can be. Isn't that wonderful? I told, I remember when Alan and I were first met, I said, Dallin, do you know he's got your pot picture in his wallet? Right under mine, but it's there. You know? <laughs> so, anyway. Uh, so, uh, let's see. And I think I got to chapter 16 and verse 12. Remember, these are Jesus' words telling them about the Holy Spirit. I still have many things to say to you, he said that night as he was speaking to them from his heart about his leaving. I have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he speaks, he, whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. And I know that the Lord has revealed this to me. You know, sometimes I've wondered how I've looked back over my life and uh, how he was teaching me things. And it seems like, well, why didn't you just tell me back there? And he says, you wouldn't have understood it. You wouldn't have got it. So that's the way the Lord works with us. He, he will teach us as we're ready to receive the truth that he has for us at that point. But here's just a little illustration of how I like to think of the Godhead uh, in, uh, in the Holy Spirit's work in particular. But I, I've used this before, but I'll, I want to use it again. I think of the Godhead, uh, the Father, first of all, is this, say, this great big powerful flashlight. Just imagine it in my hand, okay? And he's this big, this powerful battery. You can't even imagine how much power comes from this particular battery. And then the light that goes forth is the Holy Spirit. And then let's just picture the cross as the focus, Jesus, okay? So when, when that uh, light is shining on the cross, you're not focused on the light, are you? You're focused on the object of that light, the object of it. And that's the way the Holy Spirit works. There's like a transparency in his personality, like that light that you're shining along your pathway. Again, you're not focused on the light. You're focused on the object of that light. So the Holy Spirit is ever focused on Jesus. That's his work, and he does a really good job at it. It's all about Jesus. So um, as we've looked at these verses, the, the Holy Spirit is also, has been referred to in one as a helper. And I believe this comes from the Greek parakletos, and it's like a, a, law, a lawyer, some, someone that comes alongside you, someone that pleads your case, someone that stands for you. So that is one of the descriptions that Jesus gave of the Holy Spirit. So we want to kind of go a little another, uh, along another path and uh, away from you know, what Jesus said about preparing them. And we're going to talk now about other benefits of the Holy Spirit. And this one has to do, and actually these were Jesus' words, and he, just think about this. Did you know that it's not even possible for you to know Christ apart from the revelation of the Holy Spirit? Are you aware that you're not even a Christian unless the Holy Spirit woos you and draws you? And the scripture is John 6:44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And this drawing is the wooing power of the Holy Spirit from the Father that even makes us aware 
that, we're a, that we are a sinner in need of a Savior and that that Savior is Jesus. So the Holy Spirit is the one that even, you know, gives us that understanding that we need a Savior and Jesus is the Savior. And then um, in Matthew 12 and 31, Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven men, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. And we all know this as the unpardonable sin. And it, 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 this is called the unpardonable sin because it's, the Holy Spirit is the only one that can reveal the Son of God to us whereby we must be saved. And when the heart becomes so hardened that we won't listen to the Holy Spirit, God knows that, and then there's no hope for repentance if we won't be, you know, if we won't respond to that wood and the drawing to the point to where our hearts are hardened and we won't hear anymore. And it's called the unpardonable sin. Uh, is defined as a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit because when Christ was on this earth, the re religious leaders were attributing his power, his miracles to demonic powers. And in fact, they were the product of the Holy Spirit that was revealing him as the Messiah. Uh, they were, Christ's miracles were to reveal who he was, and they were the work of the Holy Spirit, and these religious leaders attributed them to the works of Satan. And as they, as they rejected the Messiah, that revealed that their hearts were so hard that repentance was not possible. You know, so that's why it's an unpardonable sin is because if we don't respond to the wooing and the drawing of the Holy Spirit, there's no other way. I mean, it's not like God is not able to pardon everything, but there's just no other way if, we, if our hearts become so hard that we won't respond to that wooing of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus himself said there in John 3 and 5, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Now we all know that to be a citizen of this world to be born in the flesh or the water, as this word is, uh, as it's spoken in this scripture, uh, that we just have to be born, a product of our mother and father, right? Born in the flesh uh, of water. But to be a citizen of heaven, the kingdom of God, there must follow this spiritual birth. And that spiritual birth is only possible through this regenerating power of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit draws us, and then when we respond, the Holy Spirit has the power to regenerate us, to make us into this new creation. So let's look at, let's see, let me, I did want to bring this out as I spoke about the Holy Spirit being the transforming power that forms us into this new creation. You'll see throughout the scriptures examples of how the Holy Spirit is uh He's what I call the birthing agent of the Godhead. You'll see him right there in Genesis when the Father spoke the world into existence, the Word of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit was, you have the picture of him hovering there and bringing forth life as the Father speaks and, and Jesus, the Word of God, through Jesus, the Word of God. And then we know as uh, Mary was overshadowed with the Spirit that Jesus was, you know, formed in her womb. So I think of the Holy Spirit as the birthing agent, if you will, of the, uh, the Trinity. But in Titus 3 and 5, we read, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. How? Through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So clearly here, spiritual birth, not works of righteousness, is what gives us eternal life. And when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, God imparts that divine life into our spirits at the time that we receive the Lord. And I like to think of it, well, I think this is the truth. To me, this is the absolute truth. There where Adam sinned against God, uh, he, you know, the, God had told him, if you partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. Well, he didn't die on the spot, did he? 
but he began to die physically. But guess what? He did die immediately spiritually. He no longer had that that intimacy with the Lord. Thus, they no longer spirit to spirit. That was broken because of his disobedience. But the wonderful thing is, Pat, that the moment we receive Christ, that is reconnected. I mean, you might not feel any different, but let me tell you, you are reconnected to your Creator when you receive Jesus as your Savior. Now, we've still got this old flesh, we've still got this soul that we battle against, but in the Spirit, we are made new. We are one with God. We're re- we are connected to our Creator. <clears throat> so that's something good to remember. So as we looked at that scripture, uh, this this washing, this regeneration, is that internal cleansing that takes place by the Holy Spirit. God washes us how? From sin by the blood of Jesus. And through that washing, that cleansing, we become a new creation. We're born of the Spirit. This is how you're born of the Spirit, this process. So as we look at the regeneration, which has to do with salvation, but then the Holy Spirit also does this continual uh, renewal, this salvation. And what that's all about is that after we're saved, then we begin to be transformed into the likeness of Christ. You know, if we read the Word and if we're obedient and if we listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit, it's like a, a process. And it's like a baby being born. They're not born speaking English and, or whatever language and, and walking. It takes, it's a process, isn't it? And so it is with, with the Christian life. It's a process. And it never ends. I mean, there's never, uh, a fi- the finish line is when you go on into eternity. That's, that's when, it's, when you're finished. So uh, the Holy Spirit does have a transforming power that begins at conversion. And as we yield to Him, we will produce the purity of God in our lives. 1 Corinthians 6.11, and this is Paul. Such were some of you. You. And if you look at that scripture and look at the verses preceding that, Paul is referring to people that live worldly, immoral lives. He's just spoken about that. He says, such were some of you, but, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. So we can all say that so, so were we, but now. Now we're, we're washed, we're renewed by the Spirit of God. So as we've talked about this rebirth and then this renewal, they're the work of the Holy Spirit. The rebirth again means that we come alive after being spiritually dead. The renewal is all about that change that takes place as we mature in Christ. So the Holy Spirit continually at work. First of all, in salvation, drawing us unto Jesus, then He may form. We are created in this, made this new creation because of His transforming power. Then, as we walk through this life, we continually mature in Him. And uh, we are warned to not grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4 and 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be compassionate and kind to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So what is this grieving? The grieving usually takes place when we've lost intimacy with someone that we love. And that when we sin like this, when we allow these things in our life without repenting quickly, and returning to God-like character, we grieve the Holy Spirit. And you can't do that and have intimacy with Him. The same way you can't have intimacy with anyone if you've grieved them. You have to bring restoration. And we know the way to do that is to repent, don't we? Just repent, and then then that we will be restored. But don't allow these things in your life. If for no other reason, so your intimacy will not be broken because you cannot have intimacy with the Holy Spirit and have these things in your life ongoing. Um, so as we looked at this section, we've talked about how it takes the wooing of the Holy Spirit to reveal our need for a Savior, and then the revelation that Jesus is the way and the only way to be reconciled to our Creator. We would never be saved in the first place. And then the Holy Spirit is the means through which the Father transforms us into a new creation. 
and, be, and continually renews us into the image of Christ as we mature and as we grow in Him. And then as we move on to another area of thinking, um, we can't even understand the Bible or grasp spiritual truths without the Spirit of God. Can't even do that. 1 Corinthians 2.13 and this is what we speak, not in words taught to us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. The natural man does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for their foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. And we know that in the first place, uh, the Holy Spirit inspired these words, uh, the, Holy, uh, the Bible, Holy Spirit inspired those words. It's a living book, and then he inspires them to our hearts till they're not mere words, but they're living words. So only Christians filled with the Holy Spirit can understand uh, the Word of God, and we can still let the flesh and the soul get in the way of that. Believe me, it's not complete understanding, but it, it, it's, it is understanding. Let me get a drink here. <clears throat> And then um, Romans 8, 26 speaks about how the Holy Spirit intercedes for us and helps us to pray. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now, I hope you caught that little word, helps. <laughs> he doesn't pray for you, but he will take your moanings, your groanings, your ineffective, weak prayers, and he will take, take them to Jesus and make sense out, make them effective, the, that fervent, effective prayer that availeth much. And then the Holy Spirit gives us discernment between true and false teaching. Are you getting all these wonderful benefits of being, you know, aware of the Holy Spirit? 1 John 2.26, I have written these things to you because you need to be aware of those who want to lead you astray. But you've received the Holy Spirit and he lives within you, so you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. For the Spirit teaches you all things. What He teaches is true. It's not a lie. So continue in what He has taught you and continue to live in Christ. So know the Word. Study the Word. If somebody's saying something that you get a little flag over, go deeper in the Word. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you understanding. And He will. Uh, and also, I love this scripture about how the Holy Spirit seals us and guarantees that we have eternal life with our Lord in heaven. Ephesians 1.13 And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Man, what a verse. What a verse. What a powerful verse. And as I studied that in the past, I just, well, first of all, let me tell you, I had had early on in my life, I, I don't know how else to put it, but embraced once in grace, always in grace. In other words, if you're saved, you're always saved. That I truly believe that. And uh, I still do, but I'm going to get back to why I do. Uh, but uh, I, that came to a place in my life where uh, I had some willful sin in my life. And uh, I'm, I, I didn't have intimacy with the Holy Spirit anymore. And you know what? I missed Him more than I loved that sin. And when I tried to get back to him, this voice said, you've gone too far. You might as well go on, girl. You don't belong to the Lord. And I listened to that for a little while, and I believed it, and I was really discouraged. 
and um, didn't even read the word anymore. I felt real dirty and didn't want any part of it. Felt condemned by it. And we know what voice that is. But anyway, one day after that had gone on for a while, I was drawn to the Word of God. I had to pick it up. Well, I mean, I, I was drawn to You don't have to do God didn't make you do anything, but I felt drawn to it. And I turned to that scripture. I know I've shared this before, but this was one of those turning points in my life. And I picked up the, 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 the word, and it just fell open to John 10, and I've never had anything that spoke to me more clearly than this little girl crawling up into Daddy's lap and him saying, Listen, I've got something to tell you, daughter. John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Now if Jesus had come down and spoke to me personal, right there in the flesh, it wouldn't have made any greater impact. I mean, he spoke to me. And you know what that did for me? That didn't say you can go out and do anything you want to and it'll be okay. That said, Jesus, you love me even when I'm sinning. I love you. Thank you. And I, it just overpowered me that he loved me anyway. I must have had this idea that he just loved me because I was this good little Baptist girl, you see. But he still loved me when I was a bad Baptist girl. And it just is <laughs> like... It changed me, and I was so conscious then of hurting him or offending him or grieving him. And, I, I mean, what's, what price would you pay for that? It just changed. The, you know, I just I knew he loved me anyway. And how I want to take this back to this scripture. So I was convinced that nothing could take me out of my Father's hands. I, you can believe what you want to. We still worship together. we still brothers and sisters, but that is my belief, and I have more proof for that. So here's where I'm going. So I got into a, a, another group of people. Now, I'm not saying anything bad about that, but they were like, you know, there are scriptures that can make you question that, that sound like you can lose your salvation. There are. You really can lose. And I want to be honest. I want to be honest with myself, and I want to be honest with people that I share my faith with. If there was another truth, I wanted to know it. If I was not, you know, if I had missed it somewhere, I wanted to know it. I, I don't like, I like truth, whatever it is. So anyway, I was questioning that. And then I was studying this scripture one day, and it says, When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. And my mind went to the Old Testament and how it talks about these kings and how they would have these wax seals and they would each one have their insignia, you know, something that designated who they were. And when they'd write out a legal document and they, that they were going to stand behind, they would either roll it up or they'd fold it up and they'd put that seal on it. And nobody could break it. They, they were saying, this is a genuine article. I wrote this, and I will stand behind it. You get the picture? So as I was studying this, I was thinking, God's seal is the Holy Spirit. He knows when a person is the genuine article, when they have really repented, when they've really received Jesus as Savior. He's not going to put that seal on there in the first place unless he knows you're the genuine article. So that's, that's how that spoke to me. So the question is not can you lose your salvation, but did you ever get it? You know? So if you, I, I am firmly convinced that if you've ever been saved and God knows whether it's true or not, you might even fool yourself, but we can't fool Him. He takes the seal of the Holy Spirit and He puts it on your heart and He says, this is the genuine article. And no, this is my guarantee, the seal of the Holy Spirit, that you are going to be with me in eternity. And I love how the Holy Spirit is called that deposit that guarantees our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. It's like we're a house for sale, this great big old for sale sign out in the yard of our lives. Jesus, we receive Christ. He comes along and he 
the Holy Spirit becomes this deposit. The for sale sign is gone. We're not for sale anymore. So this deposit of the Holy Spirit is guaranteeing that God is going to be with us until we step on over into eternity and we'll get the fullness of all that he has then. But we, you know, he's made that deposit and we are his. And so I just love this scripture and I love how it spoke to me in a way that I, had, you know, that I hadn't seen it before. But it, it just gave me some clarity on something that I was searching for truth. And then... Um, Let's think about how before the Holy Spirit came some 2,000 years ago, did you know that there were entire generations when only one man here and there heard from God or could speak for God? And in fact, between the Old and New Testament, there's 400 years when we have no record of God speaking to anybody. So do you know how thankful we should be and... This is an incredible time to live, and that is why I want us to try to get a hold of why Joel's prophecy fulfilled at Pentecost was so amazing. I've just given you that, how it was before that. Common people like us could not hear from God or speak for God. Only a special one here and there. But Joel's prophecy fulfilled at Pentecost and we know on that day, the Holy Spirit, for the first time in history, became available to all of us who believe. So we go there now and look in Acts 2.14. The Holy Spirit had come. These men were filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, speaking the wondrous words of God in, in tongues, and everybody could understand what they were saying. I don't know whether it was a miracle of tongues or hearing, but there was a miracle going on, on there. And uh, as this strange thing was taking place, Peter stood up with the eleven. He lifted up his voice and he said to the people there that had gathered, Ye men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, be this known to you and hearken to my words. These men are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it's but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. Amen. So beginning there at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was given, is available to all who will believe in Jesus to dwell in us day by day. And through the baptism, we are empowered to do God's will. So I'm winding this up now. <clears throat> and when I started uh, getting this study together, <clears throat> and it started with Mount Sinai, and then it went over to Pentecost, didn't realize that they're tied together. Did you know that? I mean, I was just like, God, yeah, wow, let's talk about this. So as we begin our study today, we remembered how God shook that mountain there at Mount Sinai and he spoke to the people. Now these people were the Hebrews and he had delivered them from bondage to Egypt 50 days earlier. And he called them out to be a special people to him. So on that day at Mount Sinai, the people of Israel were given the Ten Commandments verbally to instruct them how they had, must live in order to be this holy set-apart people for God. So on that day, they became a nation, a nation through which God had chosen to reveal himself to the world. And this was the day that was to become the appointed for the Pentecost feast. Now, uh, did Pentecost just means 50. And this was 50 days after Mount Sinai was 50 days after they had left, been delivered from slavery in Egypt. And God would establish the feast of Israel for the people to observe when they came into the land that God would give them. Now, there were seven feasts. I hope you can follow me here. It's a little bit 
complicated. Well, it, in a way it is. But God gave them seven feasts to observe, but they were really like the first three were in a cluster, uh, uh, and they're called Passover. Then we have Pentecost, and then the last three were in a cluster, and they're called Tabernacles. So God gave them this feast to observe. Now, what were these feasts all about? They were to remind the people of an important event that happened during this time that God delivered them from their bondage. And they, it was all about remembering how God had moved so miraculously in their lives. This was what the feast was all about. And uh, this was about them teaching, as they observed the feast all through the future, that it would do not only remind them, but it would teach their children about what God had done. And it would all generations were to learn about the miraculous works of God on their behalf through these feasts. And God instructed Moses on the specific dates for each feast. And the dates for the feast coincided with the original event. But here's the truth that I love, that it just really is incredible to me. Each feast was a type or a shadow of, or a picture, if you will, of a greater event that Jesus would fulfill in his death, his resurrection, the sending of the Holy Spirit, and in his second coming. All of these feasts either have been fulfilled by Jesus or will be fulfilled by Jesus to the T. Much more than I'm going to go in. But I love that when I begin to see it. It just, uh, you know, it just made me hungry for more to know more about it. Now, the feast that we're probably the most familiar with is Passover. And uh, we've come to call it Easter, or I prefer to call it Resurrection Sunday. Mm -hmm. On the Jewish calendar, which is set by moon phases, this date is always the same as the original event. And that's the date that God specified to keep for that particular feast. Now, uh, this uh, Passover was, you know what it was? It was a reminder of that tenth plague when all the households without the blood of the lamb on the doorpost would be visited by that death angel and the firstborn would be slain. So this is what Passover is all about. In the Egyptian homes, all the firstborn died that night and the next day they were really glad for the Hebrews to leave and to take their God with them, weren't they? But we know that the Israelites were spared. Why? Because they had been instructed to kill that sacrificial lamb and to apply the blood uh, to their doorpost. And they were also instructed to eat the flesh of the lamb. Now the night they, they left their bondage, just, just picture this now. They've, they've got the blood over the doorpost. They've got the lamb within them. They're set free that night. They're, they're supposed to go out in a hurry. So they go out to toward their promised land with the, the lamb, of, blood of the lamb over them and the flesh of the lamb in them. And it's very easy to see how Jesus fulfilled the Passover feast because he became our sacrificial lamb and by his blood and flesh, we're set free from our bondage to sin and on our way to the promised land. Do you see the pictures there, how, how they are so alike? And as we look at uh, some of the parallels in this uh, account of what the people were instructed to do on the, in that final plague, we will see more of how Jesus uh, fulfilled it. In the preparation for the Passover, each Hebrew was... Uh, it, they were told to select a perfect lamb. And they were told when to do exactly when to do it. It wasn't random. Uh, God said to do it on the 10th day of the month. And then they kept it. They inspected it. They watched it for four days. And they were instructed to sacrifice it at twilight on the 14th day, which was to become Passover. Well, the amazing thing is... Well, let's talk about they put that blood there on, on the cross piece, on the side post of the door. We know the angel of death uh, didn't stop there because they were protected by the blood of the lamb. But where there was no blood, the firstborn was slain. So let's just think about a few ways that Christ fulfilled this. He rode into Jerusalem on the 10th of Nisan, the very day that they selected their lamb. We know he was, he was on public display. They, they looked at him and they questioned him and they could find no fault in him for four days. And he was crucified on Passover, Nisan 14, just as the Passover lambs were killed. 
We know the lamb's bones were not broken, and we know Jesus' bones were not broken. And the blood of the lamb applied to the Israelites' doorposts saved the firstborn, and the blood, Jesus' blood saves us. His death, his resurrection fulfilled the Passover. And that night, the people couldn't pray hard enough. They couldn't be good enough. They couldn't save their lives anyway other than to do what God had said is to shed the blood. And it's, that's not changed. We can't pray hard enough. We can't be good enough. The only way to, to be saved is to have the blood of Jesus applied to our lives. So there, when you go on over now to Acts 2 and the coming of the Holy Spirit, this was the Pentecost feast. These men were gathered here for that event. Acts 2 is what that was all about. Uh, but but uh, before Jesus ascended into heaven, he told his disciples to, to go and to wait for the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit. And the purpose was to empower them to be his witnesses. So this particular feast that we're talking about, Acts 2, was 50 days after the Lord's resurrection and became the fulfillment of that event at Mount Sinai. The coming of the Holy, the, the coming of the Holy Spirit was the fulfillment there. So as the people observed Passover, the giving of the law, they're becoming God's people. The Holy Spirit fell upon those waiting as Jesus had instructed. And so let's, let's think a little deeper about how the Holy Spirit falling uh, was the fulfillment of the Mount Sinai and the giving of the law. As God spoke from Mount Sinai, this gave birth to the nation of Israel as the people that God had chosen to reveal himself to the world. The church was birthed at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell. The church is the people that God has chosen to reveal Jesus to the world. But there's a huge difference too. The different, huge difference is that at Mount Sinai, the, these commandments were written on tablets of stone and they only revealed the sin of the people because within themselves they, they couldn't keep God's commandments. They told Moses, all that God has said we will do. But uh, with their best efforts, they couldn't, they couldn't do that. But we know that with the coming of the Holy Spirit that He now writes His Word on our hearts. Ezekiel 36, 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove you from, I will remove from your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. So thank God for the similarities, for the differences. But I just, it's just beautiful to see Mount Sinai, the Old Testament, Jesus, through, the, through his death and resurrection and the sending of the Holy Spirit, the fulfillment. And now, you know, we are God's people, and he has empowered us to do just that. So we, we, uh, we're, we're just so blessed because we have the Holy Spirit to empower us. And you know what? Even with that, we won't do it perfectly. But the good news is we don't have to because Jesus did it perfectly. But I, I want us to all be aware that, you know, if you've truly been redeemed, you won't continue in sin. You will not continue in sin if you have this heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone. So if you find yourself being content in sin, you would do well to question if you've truly got that seal on your heart. So I, th I, th I think that's this the word, that, the precaution that I want to speak to everyone tonight. You just make, make sure, you know, if you're happy living in sin, you, you'd, better, you'd better do some accounting to the one that can change all that. So uh, if you'll stand now, we'll just to be, uh, finish up with this lesson.